Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of the show, we talk about doing the minimum in the gym to elicit the maximum amount of change. Later, we talk about Sal's deadlift record. He's very proud of that. Woo! We also talk about Orgasm Inc. on Netflix. I think that there is a cure, and that cure is female orgasm. As well as other topics. In the second half of the show, we coach four live callers on questions such as, how do I transition from bodybuilding to powerlifting? What is the best way to train to have a balance between looking good and performing well? And how can I add some weight without gaining unwanted fat? One more thing, if you haven't subscribed to our Mind Pump Clips channel yet, go over there and subscribe. We have short clips that are easy to watch and to share. All right, enjoy the show. The goal should always be to do the least amount of work to elicit the most amount of change. Wise man once said that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've heard that before. Hey, well, in other words, <laughs> the clip's going to go viral for you. I said it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, quit. I quit, well, I quit no, after that. No, no. Truth is, that, I most mean, to put, it, ever. to put it differently, you're always looking for the minimum effective dose. And here's why. Because when you do the minimum effective dose, first off, it's effective. So it works. But second, it takes less resources, produces less damage. And it allows for the normal fluctuations of stressors and issues in life. Because if you're always doing the most you could possibly do, one night of bad sleep, one stressful conversation, your diet is off a little bit. Well, now you're, now you're not progressing at all. So this allows for regular life to occur and for you to continue to progress. So this uh, is know, why this is so important. It's one of my favorite things to say because I think it flies in the face of totally the, the, uh, the dominant narrative in our space. The dogma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just I think we we highlight and we celebrate um, the hype and the the motivational quotes and the how hard, how long. Yeah, and I think that that feeds into a bad relationship with exercise and nutrition for a majority of people. Now, does that not mean that I think there's value in uh, pushing ourselves past our limits? Sometimes does that mean that I don't think I should ever stretch myself? Or if I was an athlete, if there is not some value in in building mental fortitude by pushing beyond and so that? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm speaking to the general population that is trying to get healthier, that's trying to build muscle, that wants to lose body fat, that wants to be more mobile, that wants to live a better quality life. That's who I'm talking to when I when I say that, and I think that that that's the message that those people need to hear more of, and less of this hype it's, bullshit. It's a fundamental yeah. diff change in how we view exercise. The way that we tend to view exercise is that the progress and the results and the benefits happen during the workout. So it's the pain, it's the sweat, it's the calorie burn. That's what's important. That's the lead. Those are those are not important. I mean, there's some value in some of that. But the most of the value is in the adaptation that occurs afterwards. So really what you got to do is look at your workout and say, how can I send this signal to my body to get the adaptations I'm looking for and then stop? Anything beyond that, anything over sending that signal, now it's just <clears throat> taking away resources and requiring more recovery. And then, and then this is what happens. You train that way where you go above and beyond what's necessary and your life screws it up because you, you're going to have days where you're not going to have perfect sleep. You're going to have days where you're a little more stressed. So the long-term fail rate with this constantly pushing yourself to your limit is super high. Now, if you do the minimum effective dose, it's still effective. And over time, it's just, it's way more effective because things don't interrupt it. Quite Dude, I have the perfect slogan for this. You guys ready? <laughs> yeah, go. Don't be a martyr, be smarter. Oh, wow. That was actually pretty good. Deep. Train on a t-shirt. No, but that, this message has been a, a tough one for me to adopt. I remember I used to make fun of Adam all the time. Because <laughs> oh, really? then he would do like the all show, no go. And yeah. like, you know, he like owned all that. And, you know, no, no girl asked me how much I bench in the bedroom. Yeah. And, you know, and it, so like. <laughs> and a bunch of stupid lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this this the short first one's the one that stuck. You know? Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, no, it's so true though. Because. uh there's just such this mentality that you need to punish yourself and that's all kind of wrapped into the hype and the, yeah. um, like more is better and, and all of that. And, and, you know, to just kind of pull yourself out of that and actually like really assess what's working for you and like what's moving you forward. Um, even with, with your physique, with your overall health, with your energy, with all these other factors that are important. Uh, that's really what you need to be it concerned also, with. It also feeds into the self hate model. Like if, if I just today, 
all of a sudden I'm motivated. I need to work out. I haven't worked out ever or in 10 years. I'm overweight. I'm, I, I look gross or whatever. I'm going to be drawn to workouts that are going to punish me because I'm already hating myself. So it's going to feel cathartic. Yeah, let me go to the gym and sweat it out. Let me go make myself sore. That's what I deserve. So the fitness industry knows that and they capitalize on it. And this is how they sell crazy workouts and diet pills and extreme diet plans because people are entering into it, hating themselves. When uh, We've talked about this many times. You want long-term success. You have to view this from a self-care model. Otherwise, exercise sucks and diet sucks. But if you're <laughs> taking care of yourself through that, they both are great because I'm working, I'm taking care of myself. I'm eating, I'm, I'm nourishing my body. And when you do it that way, you tend to do the right dose. And the right dose is the minimal effective dose. That's what people need to realize. The right dose is the minimal effective dose. More than that is, an, is, the, yeah. is the wrong dose. That's I, when things- I think this is such an important message uh, in particular today, you know, after Thanksgiving, everybody yesterday crushed all kinds of yep. food and probably sat around and watched football. They want to go and make up for it at the gym now. Yeah, and so uh -huh. then the the reaction to that is the next day or a couple of days later, they get in the gym and it becomes this like punishment and hardcore calorie restriction. And it's like, that's only going to lead you to a uh, uh, failure. Yep. Um, yeah, let me tell a story around this real quick. If I, I met Doug in the second half of my career as a trainer when I understood this. And thankfully, that was the case because I don't think I would have been quite as impactful with Doug had I not. So just to tell the story, Doug came to me. He had a, a, a recurring back injury, but he'd been working out for years. He, had, he was no newbie when it came to exercise. The guy had been working out since he was a teenager. So he comes to me willing and ready to hire me for like five days a week. Like he literally was ready to pay me to train him a lot because he was really serious about getting fit, wanted to build muscle. I don't want my back to hurt. And I told Doug, and luckily I'm a good salesperson. I told him, no, you're only going to work out with me twice a week. Take away clothes. And I, no, I remember, I remember when I said that to him, he didn't believe me. I had to literally close him on the fact that we're only going to work out twice a week. And then I told him, I said, let's just watch what happens. Let's see what happens. And he trusted me. And the two days a week workout for somebody who was already experienced, already been working out, Doug hit PRs in his 40s uh, and late 40s in deadlifts and squats and bench presses and got the best physique of his entire life. Two days a week. Yeah. Two days a week with that. Yeah. It, it, was the, it was the right dose uh, of training. And had I not done that, um, I would have lost Doug. I don't think Mind Pump would have even started. We wouldn't have created maps. But that was that, that's exactly the application. It worked. And it worked for him. So pretty crazy. What's up, everybody? Uh, here's the giveaway. The super bundle. Before I tell you how you can enter... We are doing our Black Friday sale once a year. It's happening right now. 60% off every single MAPS workout program, including bundles. And you can use the code multiple times. So 60% off everything and anything at mapsfitnessproducts.com. But you have to use the code Black Friday for the discount. All right, here's how you can win free access to the Super Bundle. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we choose you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. And then boom you won the super bundle for free. All right, here comes the show. Let's go. Let's get to this uh, Organifi release, bro. This is it, right? Today is, it's like, it's live. It's here. The packaging is all done. Like people can actually go purchase so it now. This, this, so I, I had the opportunity to put this together with the people of Organifi. Um, and they have some really smart people over there that understand, um, you know, how certain compounds affect the body, how to combine certain compounds. They also have a very holistic mindset, which I love because I wanted, you know, loosely a pre-workout. Like I wanted something that gave people energy that you could use before workout, before work, a creative endeavor, something you could take in the morning. But I didn't want, and I know this, like people, especially people who abuse uh, pre-workouts, they just want more and more stimulants. I said, no, I want something healthy that's going to give people calm focus, the kind that's going to be productive, not the kind where you're kind of, you know, gacked out of your mind. And that's what we did. That's what we put together with, uh, with peak. So peak I balance. feel like, I don't know, I'm more excited about this than even you are, which is crazy to me because how bad you wanted to do this. But I think what's so neat is, and, and it was you who said this when we all first met, um, you know, when we were, were kind of like laying out what we saw as the vision of the podcast. And one of the statements that you said first out of all of us was that you really wanted to merge health and wellness with performance. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were separate. They, there was, there was, you were, you were, if you were a sports performance type of lifter training athlete, it was, there was definitely a, a genre of people that, that gravitated towards that. And then if you were the health and wellness 
type of person. There was a genre of people that grabbed it. And there was so much for each side to learn from each totally. other. And the goal was, could we bridge that gap with this conversation here and teach people that are in, you know, that are doctrined by one of them and explain to them the values on the other side. And this whole idea of peak performance as a supplement and coming from a health and wellness brand is to me such a cool example of something that you envisioned and you wanted eight, nine years yeah. ago. Well, obviously I tested it before, but then I didn't use it uh, until this morning. So you guys know the video I sent you guys this morning. Uh -huh. I, hit, I, hit a, I hit a deadlift I haven't hit in like 10 years. Uh, I did uh, 585. So that's six plates on each side. I pulled it at 43 years old. I haven't done that since I was like in my early 30s. Uh -huh. But in the morning, so to prep for this, first, there's two things. One, came out, came out smooth too, by the way. It, I, I could have hit six. I could have pulled six. And I think wisdom is starting to set in a little bit because my ego was like, go for six. And I was like, nah, let's <laughs> keep it. Let's keep it there. And I didn't hurt myself. Let's keep it there. But the way I've been, uh, you know, what led up to that was I cut the volume of my training. So earlier we talked about minimum effective dose. That is a hard thing to, to, to follow, especially if you're a vet veteran or been training for a long time. Even for me, because my training tends to, con it, it starts here and it's working and then it slowly moves into more and more and more until I'm overtraining. And it takes me a while to realize I need to scale back, but I scale back. We, you know, doing kind of the maps 15 kind of version of type workouts, mm -hmm. noticing my strength is going up. I'm feeling good bumping my calories. I'm feeling great. So last week I pulled 535 and I'm like, I think I got, I think I got six plates. I think I could do that next week. So I got good sleep prepared. Mm -hmm. Then I took three scoops of this bad boy yeah. this morning. So I had three scoops of peak power, got on the bar, ripped it, videotaped it. So I have the evidence. So you guys can't say I'm full shit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yes. I got it in my, I got it in our text. I got yes. it on the Instagram feed. Confirmed. I got yeah, it. There was, got there was it. six of those plates. Pulling a newspaper in it to make sure <laughs> see the date. <laughs> Remember what people used Yeah, that? it's like Wolf Boy. You know, yeah. it was uh, it was legit. Uh, bro, yeah. it's pretty obvious we've aged. So I don't think there's any full yeah. of <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, No one's like, that's oh, that's from 10 years ago, Sal. Like, no, there's, <laughs> there's no full of Does anybody still use newspaper? That was a thing, too. Yeah, the, the before like, and after. It's the real. Proof. This is yeah. the date. This is today. Uh, I promise. <laughs> what? So you did three scoops. So explain again, like with the like so, caffeine dosage of that. I think it's so cool. So one scoop is 100 milligrams of caffeine, but then there's other stuff that's in here. Bayo. Oh, so that's a 300 milligram hit that you took then. Yeah. So that's yeah. Just, for me, that's a, that's a strong hit, right? Well, I don't want to. Uh, but Baobab is in there. Guayosa. There's lion's mane. You know, uh, coffee fruit <laughs> extract. Bacopa. All these things kind of work together to give you this like improvement in performance. And I wanted to dose it so that you could go low dose. Mm -hmm. So 100 milligrams of caffeine is low dose, and that's probably appropriate for most people. And then people who are bigger, who use more caffeine or drink more coffee, could go two scoops or three <clears throat> scoops. So I went three scoops, and yeah. then, you know. I'm going to try three hitter. Did, did my thing or whatever. You might need five. <laughs> just like, this stupid supplement doesn't work. Yeah, Justin's <laughs> weak. <laughs> Justin drinks coffee in dog ears. <laughs> it's like seven coffees equals yeah. one. Yep. You know what I mean? But anyway, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's why I did that. I you know, I, I, I said your quote at the beginning, Adam, because, um, uh, you know, half the time, I think people need to realize this on the show, half the time, I mean, we, we might sound preachy, but we're actually talking to ourselves half the time. Of course. Because it's all shit we, it's all the yes. same stumbling blocks that we continue to hit ourselves. I think that's why I get annoyed when somebody gets defensive about the stuff that we're saying. It's like, hey, come on, dude. I mean, this is, a lot of this is us sharing our own mistakes with people. That was the idea of the, the show also, was to present it in that context, not as a bunch of dudes that think we're smarter than you that are over here telling you how mm. you need to do stuff. It's like, listen, what we do have is a lot of experience, not only training ourselves, but lots of regular ass people. Yep. And we made a lot of mistakes along yeah. the way of doing things the wrong way. We've troubleshooted a lot, uh, <laughs> you know, back in the day. It, it, it's just kind of funny because like, I wish we wouldn't have experimented so much at the very beginning because I wasn't very good, you know, <laughs> but you have to kind of work through that. But like all those like the, all the challenges and all the stuff that we had to kind of like figure out. Um, that's what we're trying to convey. Like we personally went through or our clients, like there's always like an example. I think one of us can probably pull from. Oh, a hundred percent. So it's black Friday. Any guesses on, um, the like the most per I always like to try and guess the toy that's gonna get bought the oh. most or like a product that is like gonna crush like you know what's hmm. what do you see so I definitely think uh, I believe that um, and maybe Doug can fact check me on this I believe uh, Meta's second version of the Oculus it is looks better it does look better it looks cooler yeah like did you guys figure out some things did you guys see that the the, the VR headset that 
one of the Oculus founders made. It's not oh, for production. The one that like will kill you if in the game. They literally made a, an Ocu- like a like a VR headset that if you die in the VR universe, it it blows your brains out, kills you in real life. <laughs> but that's, nobody has that. I know they did. It's, they made it. I saw that. I mean, I didn't fact check it or anything. No, it's it looks, everywhere. Doug, okay. look it up. It's because, for reals. Like why? Who's going to use that? Here's the other thing. Nobody. Like like who's to say some crazy tyrannical person it doesn't like like capture somebody and like this is like some sadistic uh this is like a, a horror movie plot yeah like uh, make you play some virtual game and then the stakes are death what's that what's that movie that horror movie with the clown on the bike and he does the, the crazy come on there's like a 50 there's like a million of these these it? event horizon no oh, god no, you guys are terrible saw? Uh, saw 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 oh, it saw. sounds like that's a good job bro and you don't even like scary yeah, movies <laughs> this, blame this guy this guy should have been all over that <laughs> <laughs> hey sometimes i have off day <laughs> no look i found it right here doug did you find it it's 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 the oculus founder palmer lucky he created a vr headset that kills you if you die in the game he claims he's making that according to this article here but why why would you make this I mean, okay. That's and gotta, why would you that's tell gotta people be that? a publicity stunt? Come on, of course. That's, that's, a, got, that's a of course. That's a good call. Yeah, yeah they're getting ready to launch call. the new one. Oh, we have that's this. Get, dummies like us talking about it and debating it, oh, and it's like all we're doing is giving them free commercials. We didn't even give them a, okay, so that's not even a mind pump code. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's my the prediction. I, I predict yeah. that it will. You know what I find fascinating? Are you guys looking at the the um the usage and all this stuff? So. It did incredible, right? They made all kinds of money off of the original one. I, even I'm tempted to buy the second one just because I'm curious on the tech and I, I want to see the progress. I was so impressed with the first one yeah. as far as like the capabilities and how good it looked that I, I'm very interested to see the evolution of it. But that being said, the behaviors that are around it are pretty interesting. Like it seems that we all we, we all have them, right? I think everyone in here has one, right? I don't. Oh, you're the only one that doesn't have one? Uh-huh. Doug has one, Justin, yeah. you have one, and I have one. I and I think that we actually fall in the category of how most people have used them. Yeah, I don't Like a lot at the beginning often. and then never again? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've used mine for about 10 minutes. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, like I. That's I, why I didn't buy one. A bunch well, of um, impulse buyers over here. We bought. We, <laughs> Dude, we bought it's cool, the, but it's just Adam like, closed it's all a you guys. Party trick. Adam yeah, got this, this. is what Adam does. Adam likes to buy shit <laughs> <laughs> impulsively. My actually, but he my, likes to bring people in with this. <laughs> sell, it, sell it to everybody. Yeah. You do. I should have got commission. You, you, know, did. you guys didn't know I made twenty percent off of all your sales. <laughs> he paid, his was free. <laughs> yeah, I just want to play you guys in ping pong. Okay, I'm in. I called Oculus. Here's the deal. Shoot me one free. I'll sell my friends. Didn't you tell these guys we're like play with them? We're gonna play ping pong. Really. I mean, I was, on, I was on a kick for a minute. That <laughs> One I, minute. Yeah. No, I, I for maybe a month. Um, my Well, mine did get chewed up by my dog. So oh, that, that, yeah. doesn't, that yeah. is a, a part of why I don't have mine anymore. Because I have already had a moment where I was like, God damn it. I wish I had those because I wanted to box because I did like that yeah. as cardio. But it is interesting that um, I do think that we're more common than we're not. Yep. Yeah. I don't think a lot, of, and which flies in the face of this huge investment that Meta is making on the virtual world that we're all going to get well, plugged in. Because it's such a commitment to step out of reality in a sense. Like you're like isolating yourself from everything else, you know, like in, in terms of that versus the the augmented reality where it like, it helps to kind of bring that in to what's already around you instead yep. of like, I got to be all isolated and, and, you know, like I, I don't hear anybody else. Like I'm totally fully immersed, which is cool. But again, that's a big commitment in terms I, of like continuously. Doing I think that. it's a step. I think it's a step on the way to what's going to be the next big thing. But I don't it, think it is. You know, what's interesting also to me is that it comes at a time when it does seem that the message, at least around our space for sure, is getting a, like more and more people. I don't know if you guys know this or not. Remember when I t- wanted us to do this like a, a couple of years ago after, of course, after I read those books. I wanted us to like start a trend of like shutting all of our tech down and everything yeah. for like a day and and yeah. and like make that a thing. There's a lot of companies that are doing this that are starting to like a day off of completely of tech or a week off of tech. So it's interesting that we're right when this company is betting on all of us going all in on being plugged in and being in this virtual world. There's also this kind of pushback from a lot of people, especially in our space. Yeah. Of hey, you need to detach from these electronics, and we're all becoming there's, so dependent on them. There's all you have to do something that's innovative and groundbreaking and change kind of people's habits. Otherwise, the data shows that the most played games and the most downloaded games are simple, basic games. Yeah. 
It's the games, those apps that people play on their phone, like uh, Candy Crush, Flappy or, Bird, or whatever, yeah, yeah, shit like that. Which, by the way, that guy, you know that, you know that guy. He, I don't he know took if I, off. I don't yeah, know if I necessarily off. agree with that. I think one of the one of the most played games in the world and and profitable games would be games. Like, profitable is different, but downloaded and, and uh, played is, yeah. is those simple, basic. Well, yeah, I mean, it's simple, it's basic, it's cheap, right? So you hit a much larger demographic, but but that tells the, you, like, like that that that's a hint, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, okay, but you could also make the case for like. The, I mean, I would love to see the stats on the average pl game player that plays Modern Warfare and how many hours they put in. I have grown ass friends that are in their forties uh, yeah. that put hours a weekend still of playing that video okay, game this with is what kids. This is what it's like. You have gamers, mm -hmm. and then you have everybody else. And gamers are not the majority of the population. So okay, okay, and I like this conversation because this is where I think the the VR world and the things like Oculus are going to appeal more to. It's going to appeal more to the gamer than the average everyday yes. person. I think augmented reality. Is Going to be the I thing do that. I, I do see a slight bridge to everyday people. Um, I do think that the where it's going, and I believe this was one of the leaps that they made in the new the new uh, Oculus, is uh, making the interaction with like meetings better. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be kind of cool. Like where you're going to have these, we have so many companies now that are working from home and that are yeah. uh, like you know based with employees all over the country that being able to put a you know immersive pair of goggles on and actually have this virtual meeting where we feel like we're all in a room together. I do see some Did value to that. See, I, I, I guess there it's popular, um, but I didn't even know this is an option like within the metaverse, like people will go in there and they'll play old video games. Like in, yeah. like <laughs> you're playing a video game, in old video, video game in a video game <laughs> setting. Just like what's what is that? Uh, what's Inception. That yeah, Inception. Yeah. That's yeah. That movie. Uh, you know what? Would be, so, so, this is getting ridiculous. So I think augmented is going to be the thing that that hits the mainstream, and I think it's going to be everyday stuff like. You go online to shop. Well, instead of scrolling through Amazon, you'll be able to have something pop up and you'll be able to kind of rotate it. And I don't want that and go through this. I think it's going to be stuff like that. It's going to be like our normal habits augmented through. Yeah. Well, I think Justin, just brought, utility. <clears throat> Justin brought that up. I think that makes, I think he makes a really good point that yeah. it's less of a commitment to have things like this, right? I think that, oh. that that'll be uh, a, a way that we adopt it faster. Is I was thinking of a comparison, like, because uh, you remember um, 3D movies. Like, they've been pushing that so hard. Like, this is going to be the next wave. Yeah, but nobody likes them. It, no. Like, it, it, I, I just think, Why too, is that? It's novelty. Because, it's novelty, yeah. Because, okay. Uh, I like 3D movies when well, I was a kid. I, I, I like the VR, movies? but I look at it as, as like a party trick. Like if somebody's coming over, it's company. I'm like, oh, check this out. Yeah. You know, and it's like you can kind of uh, experience it again through them. But um, it's it's just not as consistent. Well, part I, of the reason why you don't like it or why I think you don't like it all the time is because it's it's a bit annoying. It's you have you have glasses on there. Yeah. Uh, you can still For see sure. out the side. You get a little bit of a headache or dizzy sometimes from it. It's like you got half your vision is on the 3D. Half of it's on your peripheral. It's like. It's not, oh. but the Oculus is way. That was one of the things I liked about the Oculus was I was impressed. Are they with, getting away? They're getting away from the handles. This is what I heard with with the, the uh, new the, one. Yeah, I think so. So That's it's just your hand. Awesome. My, so yeah. my theory is that the reason why the average person doesn't use them a lot is because we have a tendency to want to keep one foot in reality, and if and it, it doesn't feel like you're in a reality yet, you still feel like you're in another place in a game. So until they make it where you're like, oh my god, I'm actually in reality, which is going to take a long time. You want to know that you're still in reality. You want to have one foot in reality and one foot playing a game or being that. When you put the glasses on, you're gone. You're in there. And people don't like to be in that. Average person is like to be in that for too long. You know what I mean? Like a little bit, but not too long. You know, you have friends over. You don't want to be in this. So I, 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 that's my that's my theory. That's that's what my theory is. Yeah, it's about. a shitty theory. I think, I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's because it's, it's not there yet, bro. That's all. It's not. It's not there yet. Your and theory was it's annoying. Yeah. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, why do you not like the 3D glasses? Okay. Why do you not like? Why do you not use the 3D for all? They're, they're annoying. Yeah. Yeah. They're annoying. Exactly exactly you're right. It does yeah. annoy me. That's exactly what it is. It's just a little annoying. Science magazine. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it, that will be like a study uh, show. Oculus is annoying. Yeah. <laughs> this is why people. No, I am. I am surprised though that it's not. Uh, you know, it's not taking off like I think that they they anticipated. Although mm. I think it's cool. Well, but you know, to your point, it's a bit Dude, novel, and you don't. So, want to what do were that. the other gifts that uh, you like? Because you brought up Oculus, but were there the oh, other that, ones you uh, were still speculating on? So that's the main one that came to mind for yeah. me. I was asking you guys if you uh, had any thoughts around other no things idea. that are, are really popular. Like sometimes iPhone does really well, but the iPhone has been a bit lackluster. 
I mean, I th- the, the, well, how many how many new iPhones? Like, at what point? They're like, not that What different. else are we gonna do to it? That's exciting. It's like a little better camera. I was like nothing. Yeah, yeah, the camera is cool. Yeah. I mean, and it's it, cool, but it, like how much cooler? Yeah. It's not enough cooler for the average person. Like, if you're in like our space, I think it, you and you take a lot of video and pictures and stuff like that because you're on so much social media, which is a big chunk of the population. I think will mm. that appeals to. But I think then you have like the whole other population, like my mom and stuff like that, who's still like on iPhone six or some shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like, my mom. As long as it works, you know, what I'm saying? it takes photos, it takes videos. We just got my mom uh, the new iPhone, <clears> and she's the blue like, one. She's yeah. funny. She's like Sal. She calls me. She goes Sal. I can unlock my phone by looking at it. I'm like, man, how many phones back were you? <laughs> <laughs> That's been in there for a while, mom. I know. Mine still has a big button on it. Yeah, I, know. I don't have you to type in my code. Yeah. Or I'm like, did yours have a thumbprint at least on it? Like, how far back? That's my mom. <laughs> my mom know? has like she a hell of a old one. The yeah. I was like, send her stuff, and she's just like, I can't open this. I'm like, why can't you open this? I'm like, you have an iPhone? She goes, yes, I have an iPhone. I'm like, what iPhone generation are you on right now? I don't know. I think it's six or seven. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, it's wow. time to update, mom. That's funny. Dude, I have a new fear. I have a new fear. <clears throat> What's that? Avalanches. I watched that. Oh, dumb, my so God. You watched it? Yes. Okay, bro. I know exactly what you're trying and to And I just right saw now. another video. I just saw another video on social media. There's a guy filming a mountain. I don't know if I can find it. I got to say, I got to, let me see. I'll find it later. But he's filming from far away, bro. The mountain is like way over there. And he's filming. And there's a huge sea oh, of avalanche. Yeah. And they're all filming from far away. They're like, wow, that's so cool. And it keeps coming. And it keeps coming. Oh, and it keeps, that's oh, it right I, there. Oh, I've seen this. Look, when look. It gets in. Yeah. Look that's, how far away it is. Hey, that's an old video, right? I've seen that video. Is before. it? Yeah, it's an old video. I've seen that clip. Look at And the guy, you can tell he starts zooming out, zooming out. And then you can tell when they realize like, oh, shit, this is going to hit us, dude. Was this attached to the Nepal <clears> earthquake? <throat> oh, I have no idea. I've seen this exact video. But look, that, that's an old at, video. at this point, you know, the, everybody's like, ah, uh, fuck. Uh, it's coming wait for a us, minute. bro. It's still coming. That is, that's crazy. So anyway, there's that docu-series uh, called Avalanche Yikes. on, is it on Netflix? Yeah, Netflix. What'd you think of it, dude? Dude, I was so freaked out. Okay, so any, so they did three different locations that they kind of documented and filmed from. So for me, obviously, like scary wise, like being the ones that were actually traversing up to Mount Everest, like that's got to be the absolute worst place to be, <laughs> bro. So they, so they're they're going. First of all, I didn't know this, but just to get to the base camp of Mount Everest is like three days of like you're in the wilderness hiking, like you're going. It's, it's a voyage to get there. Yeah, and some people. That's their whole thing. That's the whole thing. Like, I'm just going to get to base it's camp. It's so insane just to get there. Like they, they really did a good job of like highlighting all the challenges yes. it, it takes for you just to get to that point. And then from there, there's like these, these not caves, but like tunnel, ice tunnels well, that you got to go through this like glacier. It's basically an then, ice like frozen waterfall. Yeah. And the ice is still Crevasses moving. Crevasses you got to cover over these sketchy ladders. Yeah, dude, it's like it's still moving very yeah. slowly because you can hear it when they're up on them. Don't you it hear that? You hear the ice still moving. Yeah. Doesn't a certain amount of people die on that every, every year? year? Yes, every year. And right? they leave the bodies up there. Super usually. dangerous. Yeah, really. Usually uh-huh. they leave the bodies because you can't find them. They died in an avalanche or they fell down a crevasse or they're we can't find the body. So people find bodies sometimes when they go up to the top. Yeah. They find, oh, this is the climber from So, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they said it was like a, uh, I don't know, like a year or six months previous to that or something. They had another like an avalanche or something, yeah, yeah, an earthquake or something, and it like covered that one area. And so they couldn't climb. And so it was like, it was closed. Yeah. And then it just like reopened. So there's all this interest of like an excess of people wanting to be able to now go so they could get to the top Bro, of they're Everest. Cli- they're climbing it. And these are all high performance like people, like people who go to do Mount Everest, everyday people, they tend to be like the kind of people that just, they just like to challenge themselves because it's crazy. So there's this one girl and she's telling her story and she's like a graduate from, I don't know, UCLA. And you can tell she's like a high achiever and that's why she wanted to do Mount Everest. Like I got to do this. Yeah. And so she does it and and the, they're climbing the, the ice waterfall part, which is literally like you're climbing mountains Mm-hmm. of ice and in between you fall down you're dead and sometimes they have to cross these crevasses with a ladder so they put a ladder flat like this yeah. and then walk across the ladder and you're looking at it and you're like that's a hundred feet foot fall if you do so anyway <laughs> they're doing that she's doing that she's literally walking across the ladder she's so proud of herself holding on to the ice and hanging yeah. and whatever and then the earthquake hits yeah and that's she's where she like was just about to go up this huge like cliff and, and the guy just got up and she's like looking up and they hear this rumbling 
And then you just all of a sudden see just this, this cloud just like coming in and just covers and boom. And then everything's just chaos, dude. Oh my it's God. It's crazy, bro. It so scared the shit out of me. One of the camps lost most of their people. Really? Yeah. Where they one so base camp didn't lose very many. They were lucky because of where they were positioned. And you hear them on the walkie talkies reaching out to the other camps. Right. And he, and he's like, look, we, we have very minimal like injuries. Nobody's, you know, we're, we, we made it out. Okay. How are you guys doing? Mass casualties. That's it. We need Expect, as much as you can send. Yeah. As much help as you can send. A lot of bodies coming. A lot down. of bodies. Is this a new documentary? It's out on Netflix. I think yeah. it's new. Yeah. And I mean, it. what's crazy is- it's intense, dude. Because I don't think they realized too that, it, well, maybe they did realize the impact of the- uh, the earthquake, but they thought it was probably better elsewhere, right? Like it was just localized there at the, the, the mountain. But as you go further out, it was just as bad, if not worse, especially into the city. Kat, is it Katmandu? Katmandu. Yeah. So there was these apartment buildings that they just kept building up and up and up and, and no regulation, no regulation. Really. And so there's all these people that just got smashed and trapped and like, uh, like literally oh, wow. buried alive. Dude, it's, it's crazy. Bad. How long ago was that? Was it? <laughs> 2000 it wasn't that long ago yeah, look up it was a, like it was like a 7.8 was it the 7.8 earthquake in nepal you can look that up or just look up avalanche the, the did you speaking of documentaries gnarly, did you guys see orgasm inc yet gosh yes. damn it i was gonna watch it you have you have to watch it yeah. so this is about I, I read the thing this is like is our, a, it's is like this, a cult you, right this is in our space Neat. Of course. It's in the health and wellness space. I roll my eyes because of well, course. Well, because it too, like you see how like, uh, uh, what's her name, Gwyneth Paltrow and like there's all these like celebrities that were promoting. This lady basically- <laughs> She had a TED Talk. She, yeah, she had a TED Talk that went viral. All right, it, so what's it about? Tell me what happens in this. So uh, it is literally, okay, so the, the theory is that, um, and you've definitely heard this theory before in our space, that, you know, we are these pleasure monkeys and like that the oh ultimate, mm -hmm. the, 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 the ultimate way to live a fulfilled life is to be in pursuit of pleasure mm -hmm. and that you should, you should continue to like always pursue that. Right. And in all aspects of life. In order to really connect with uh, other people. So basically you need to be pleasure and give pleasure with like everybody you, you interact with. So it really started off where she attracted a lot of these people that, you know, struggle with having an orgasm or touch with other people. And okay, so that's, like that's sexual abuse. Well, that's that's real deal. Well, yeah. this is why the, it turned into a cult was because it literally changed a, hundreds, thousands of people's lives. Yeah. People that really struggle with human connection and touch, people that really struggle with having their own orgasm or giving an orgasm to somebody else. And she really got these people to let their guards down and become comfortable with touching other people and even being in these envir these environments that she would cultivate around strangers mm -hmm. to be very comfortable with their sexuality. Well, and it started out mainly uh, a women empowerment thing, right? So it was like very much because it would be immediately creepy if if like if it was a dude, it was a dude and also like that the, the guy needs to get hit the orgasm, you know? It, so they've centered it all around like women getting orgasm and it became a, a demonstration thing at, at a certain point at these. Um, so it's like a group of people. Group of I'm going to give this girl an orgasm. They yes. teach a technique and, and try to use like scientific principles behind it. And breathing. Talk about and all breathing the nerve endings. Yes. And then a uh, certain technique for like 15 minutes, they would basically, basically stroke them off. Yeah. Uh, in front of everybody. And so it was like, they're like, I was so vulnerable. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every, every part of me was out there. And, I, it was, um, it felt awkward, but, you know, yeah. that's weird. And then, and then they're just, feel oh, awkward. <laughs> and then they have this huge orgasm. And then um, it, it literally just becomes, uh, they just get swept into this entire, uh, like, doctrine that she just created. And, and then they, they, they just like start recruiting people and it just keeps growing and growing, getting more popular amongst celebrities start to be like, wow, like there's something here. Uh, <laughs> like well, all these people are experiencing these, this crazy, like, like sexual health. Thing. Justin hit a really hard, but important point that I missed was that you're right. The, they really centered it around the, like the woman's empowerment movement. And so, so many people like the Gwyneth Paltrow and stuff piggybacked off of that. Like, yes, this is like strong women. Women are control of their sexuality, can control of their orgasms, take what they want. Like, you know, you, you are, you are the dominant force in this. Like, and so they, re she really, you're the dominant force. So masturbate while my friends and I walk. And have an <laughs> this is all about you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 
But I mean, she, I mean, so many people were, well, the, well, the crazy part was how much she got away with and that she's still out. So with it, was it just that they turn into like, just. No, so it, it, it okay. So it just kind of escalated and escalated and escalated to a point where like, so it became a women empowerment thing. And then, and then she started to tell her story. So you, you start to kind of piece together. And I don't know how much of her backstory is true or what she made up or what she didn't. But like, basically I think she was like molested or had some kind of mm -hmm. like bad encounter growing up and she didn't want to be a victim. And so this is another like empowering part of her story. That's like, I'm going to regain uh, the reins and take control of this and like and this did, is how did she take people's money like did she rip yeah. people off oh yeah. charge a lot of a lot money of money for these so what sessions. ended up happening okay so imagine this right a place where we're giving all these women orgasms the amount of men that would be attracted to come to these things so they would charge the men like a fucking okay. crazy premium to have, have access to these groups a lot of women either got free or a discount to be in there because the ratio was like yeah. eight, eight you know well eight. it started out women and then it be, quickly became all men <laughs> yeah. weird how that happened that's yeah. strange and the way they would balance it out is they would bring they would recruit other women for either free or for a discounted price and the now she's in the predicament she doesn't have enough women right to to be able to pair off because they used to have to pair them off because one has to do the the diddling well the other one <laughs> you know has the technique uh and so it basically it got to the point where the staff that first of all, like got so swept into her doctrine, like now believe in her and her message and all this stuff. Now they have to like all of a sudden, you know, provide the, the diddling and, and it became more than that. And it became like sex so was she's a like part a, of it. She's like a madam. Yes. Yes. It yeah. literally became that. And she and it ended up being where they would, and like Justin saying, they had like these people that were early adopters that were completely drank the Kool-Aid. She would now start to promote them. Right. And they would become like, and then she would act like a priesthood. So Master, she started, it started yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like priests. Uh, yeah. So she she wrapped in a cult doctrine, and she pulled in from other religions and started to literally like, yeah, hodgepodge piece all these things together that justified like sexual practices. She was using like passages from the Bible, a Buddha. She was using she would use all types of religions, and she would mesh it together to promote her message. Damn, it was, and, it's pretty, but dude, people just gobbled literally. It up. Sex and, cult. And here's the thing: why you got to watch it because it still exists. It's one of those documentaries where the, it leaves you hanging. Like she got away; she's mm -hmm. traveling the world somewhere and 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 cashed out. Like I think she sold the company, yeah. sold her shares, wow. got a bunch of money from it, is on the run and out. And then the company has now rebranded as Ohm. So O M. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think something Ohm. I can't yeah. remember. Oh, meditation. Me edit, meditation. Look up meditation. orgasm meditation. Yeah, yeah. They, they like smash it together. Yeah, orgasm meditation. And that's the thing too, right? Is in San Francisco. This all started. Yeah. So you got all these these tech people that are high into like it, very much so attracted that female empowerment movement yeah. movement the uh, hippie all the guys that went are exactly what you think they look like <laughs> <laughs> yeah but so Katrina and I are watching together like, like, and this oh, guy's man. talking about like how much it changed like I'm like his so original, I never had sex before yeah, yeah his original <laughs> interview is like you know he's just he's this dude this tech dude who like hasn't had sex really yeah. and you know it's like no experience <laughs> and then he's like then like hey, you bro. see him like uh, progress in the he's show smiling. he's like oh my god like he thought it was the chicks. greatest thing ever like he was <laughs> yeah. so happy about this cult you know <laughs> <laughs> he's like i found a gold mine down yeah, here yeah. with like 40 it people it changed my life he's yeah. like yeah bro you just fucked yeah. like 30 girls in the last six months <laughs> like you hit dude. the lottery pal <laughs> yeah and they're, and they're being encouraged to experiment with you inside this, this i girl. mean he moved they moved into oh. this like uh, he found he found a hack. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did <laughs> find a hack. It only cost he him like played thirty thousand dollars a year. You know, or something his, like that. In his video game. He's like, oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He had to pay a shit ton of money. Yes, yeah, so they all they they got the money. For, did you find it? One taste. That's it. Yeah, one taste. Yeah, one taste. And now it's the Institute of Ohm, O M, yes. and the Unconditional Freedom Project. Yes. Unconditional, Unconditional freedom. Oh, that sounds great. Yes. Dude, oh. but like, okay, so there's other part of it. Like, it got dark though. I mean, like, to, to go even further, they <laughs> she was like promoting rape. Like, like what? Yeah, so serious, that was a, that was a crazy turning point. At one point, she's like, let out your beast. She used what the yeah, she used the I'm she serious. used the angle of what her being molested as a child to say that they that never let a man take your power away. You control your sexuality no matter what, even if it's being physically taken 
taken from you. Yeah. So no more of this being raped and then claiming to be a victim from that. You own that. You own that. You take control of that. Let your inner beast come what out. Yeah, bro. That's Dude. what. That's where it took a hard These turn. I think was that, oh, man, when so when bad. you had situations like that. There's a girl that was a that was a, a I believe a victim of rape, and then she tried to poor like, girl. She tried to adopt this message, and then they were like, and she was there with her boyfriend, her have, and her her boyfriend was abusive, and they were like encouraging him to be abusive. Oh yeah. my god, that's terrible. That's, that's how it all started to unfold. That's terrible. Was that, was that she was starting to push all these other agendas on these you know what's funny it's i almost feel like you're guaranteed to be in a cult if sex is evolved like if you're asking if you don't know you're like am i in a cult well it's, it I just was, starts you know I, with the diddling you know what i told it look well, where, i told katrina where this last night i said you know i also think this also highlights how interesting creatures we are that we have we all have this internal desire for some sort of higher power spirituality 100%. 100%. And when and it's funny because I feel like the people that are most susceptible to these crazy weird cults are actually the biggest deniers of of religion and God. Like they're they're like they're always the people that like re totally refused like religion or God yeah. or anything like that or like and they're like oh anti that or they're atheists or agnostic. But then they something then, else becomes a religion. Yeah, something else becomes it, and then they and they fall for all the same shit. It's the same stuff that you see in in some of these crazy major religions. You know, that, you know what's crazy is that old wisdom. Okay, that thousands of year old wisdom that's found in multiple old religions. So that the world's most practiced religions that have existed for thousands of years, they all say if you don't worship God, you end up worshiping power or pleasure or I think money. it's money or mm -hmm. honor. I think are the main ones. And that's exactly what happens. Like you, yeah. you, people worship drugs or they worship climbing the, the ladder at business or chasing money or maybe just trying to sleep around who knows? or, you know, or they find some weird cult religion that says the way to spirit, you know, spiritual enlightenment is to just have as many orgasms as possible or whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's really wild to me. It is innate. I think it is innate in us to have to have that because we're, we're driven by uh, hierarchies. We're driven by decisions. Every day we make decisions and whatever decision you made was obviously better than the alternatives. So ultimately, if you follow that long enough, there's a, there's a top value. And if you don't consciously make that top value something good, mm -hmm. it's going to become something else. And you'll well, be ruled I mean, by that, it. I think that's, It'll become your God. I think that's the positive and the power of, of, of going after something that is um, unrealistic, unattainable, like a, a God-like figure, because it's they're perfect in every aspect. And so putting that as your highest value it'll be a forever journey for you. Right. You'll never have the perfect life. You'll never be exactly like Jesus. Right. You'll never be that person. So the pursuit of it for the whole rest of your life is what leads to this fulfilling type of life versus you could reach the top of the corporate ladder. Yeah. You could reach ultimate, the, as much sex and orgasms as you can today. Like yeah, well, all those what things, when you get there? all those things do eventually cap out. And then what happens when you do cap out? Like where are you still fulfilled and what happens as far as your pursuit afterwards, yeah, if well, you've built most of your worth around that. Yeah. And the religion, will tell you that the world religions will say we have a yearn you have a yearning for god and if and you if you try to fill that with something else you'll it's like drinking seawater to to quench your thirst you'll need more and more and more and more and it becomes addictive and it's it's this is what they say but it seems to be true it really does seem to be true so yeah. anyway really interesting um we're supposed to mention sleep me i want to tell you guys this uh, really interesting did your wives Body temperatures change dramatically, or dramatically change their preference for hot or cold in the house when they were pregnant. <laughs> when they were pregnant. I was gonna say, you're pregnant. Yeah, I was like, no. I'm like, it's funny you're bringing this up, bro. Your wife is pregnant. Yeah, you do yeah. know that's like crazy, bro. It's like way dramatic. So my, she's constantly hot. My yeah, favorite, we were almost on the same level. We finally. were. So that um, I that was actually one of the best things. America Katrina and I have been together 12 years. Had a kid now for three. So, and the temperature thing has been one of the, you know, the big you know, wedges in the relationship on how to, how hot to keep it or how cold to keep the house. And it's been one of those things that she could just never figure, like does not understand me until she got pregnant. When she got pregnant, she literally felt like I felt where it was, she was so hot all the time. And I remember looking at her being like, okay, you see how you feel right now? I feel exactly how you feel all the fucking time. That's how did I, you guys, I run like yeah. that. Did she yeah. change her, 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 her Uller yeah. temperature? Yeah, yeah. She didn't use heat at all during the pregnancy. She does now, right? So yeah. she's, and it, and it, go, it went back, right? So it was only during the time that she yeah. was pregnant that that because happened. Because you guys were complete opposite. You were like freezing. And she yeah, was, she runs hers right now at 80 and I run mine at 55. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. But when she was pregnant, she brought it down to zero. She brought it down, yeah, with me or wouldn't wow. run it at all. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, yeah. You know, speaking of them, we actually, they're the last ones for me to wrap up for the Utah play. So when this goes live, 
most of, I'm knock on wood, no, most of the Utah property should be done. I believe we get the last bit of our theater chairs. Oh, yeah. Uh, this week. I know Justin just ordered some cool decor for the theater. Um, I know PRX is en route to land there uh, this week. I have I contributed zero to the decor, <laughs> and I think that was by design. Yeah. I mean, you guys, I'm pretty mean, sure. You're part of like, the deciding, the color of the, oh, the counter. Oh, actually, I had the good, blue. The blue right? kitchen is you. I had that input. Nobody hates the blue kitchen well, we'll itself. Do they really? <laughs> I mean, I, we I haven't had, seen how it turned out yet, though. I, so, have, yeah. I had input on the on the stonework. That was about it. Yeah, yeah. Stonework. Everything else, stonework I don't trust and, my input. And, you guys and, have better input than I do. Um so yeah, so it's it's pretty much close to being done. So I'm hoping probably the next time that we record a podcast, I'll be giving a link to people. I've had a lot of DMs around people asking Let's go. when the house will be ready. Most of everything will be there pretty quick. The last things that I'm waiting on besides uh, the Uller thing I should have are the Sleep Me. They're, it drives me crazy that they changed the name. Sleep Me will be there <laughs> by, that, uh, by that time. The one thing that may take a little longer, I'll get the cold plunge in time. Uh, the sauna will be the one that will be the the sauna and the, the and the jacuzzi will be the two that might be a little late. So oh, it's gonna be rad. Mm. I know, I'm excited. Sleep me, bro. What's up, everybody? This is just a reminder. Black Fridays right now, sixty percent off all Maps workout programs, including bundles. Sixty percent off across the board. Go to MapsFitnessProducts.com and use the code Black Friday for the discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Amanda from Texas. Amanda, how can we help you? Hey there, guys uh, from Texas. Nice to meet you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Um, listen to you guys. So uh, just to my question real quick, um, I, I'm a bodybuilder since 2018 and I've uh, been doing bodybuilding for so long, but uh, I recently finished one of my last competitions on September 8th. And I noticed that I started losing muscle. Um, I didn't like the feeling of losing strength. So I kind of want to close that chapter and go to powerlifting. Uh, what do you guys recommend right now? I just finished y'all's uh, symmetry. I loved it. Uh, I'm doing right now the five by fives. But what do you think I should do next? Uh, I'm thinking of competing for powerlifting in the summer, maybe June, July. Uh, but what do you guys recommend transitioning from bodybuilder to powerlift and uh, what programs you recommend? Yeah. Are you familiar with our programs? Uh, very much. Yes. Me and my partner, uh, when we can, we try to get it, uh, when you guys have your discounts, try to get your, um, programs. We have a symmetry we've done pretty much anabolic, everything like that. And awesome. uh, because of you guys, we transitioned to uh, trainers actually, and oh, good uh, deal. our clients love all your work too. We try to help them. And, um, because of you guys, we're, we're doing great things on ourselves and clients and people out there. Well, because, because she's coming from bodybuilding, I would actually, the, the, obvious answer is power lift, but I actually would run performance first just because of your, your, your bodybuilding background. I think performance will serve you uh, better first because we have time too, right? So we have time for powerlifting. And you said it's spring. Is that when we're thinking? So you said uh, I'm thinking summertime, uh, oh, give oh, me yeah. a little bit. Oh yeah. Go. You got plenty of time. So I would, I would run performance first and then transition into power. Yeah. So that. that's mm -hmm. actually, yeah, that's a good point. excellent advice because what that'll do is that'll protect you from the issues that can arise. That almost always arise when somebody trains uh powerlifting for a long time, right? Which is you're not doing a lot of lateral movements. There's no rotation. And although you get stronger, you tend to notice aches and pains and bodybuilding training doesn't necessarily <laughs> address that very well. Mm -hmm. Now performance will. And so what'll happen is you'll do performance then you'll get into power lift, and at the end of power lift, you're going to be much stronger and feel much better than had you not done yeah. performance to begin with. So well, I think that's phenomenal advice. Yeah, I like that advice, mainly because, too, like you're going to train these these full body movements, and it's very much more movement based. So coming from bodybuilding to switching over to um, power lift, you're really going to have to understand how uh, to generate more force and to be able to get your body synchronized. So it's it's not segmented because that's one thing, especially with deadlifts. I see that a lot yep. with bodybuilders kind of transitioning over. It's a bit tough with that. So yeah, I really like that. Advice. Yeah, that's also a great point. So Justin, basically making the point that the switch from bodybuilding to powerlifting is it's like you're switching from feeling the muscle to perfecting the movement. And math performance is a great segue to power lift. It really trains you to be movement focused and not muscle focused. Now, what can you expect from training this way? You're going to build muscle. You're going to build muscle. You're going to get stronger, especially if you combine it 
with a diet where you're feeding your body, where you're eating in a, in a, in a little bit of a surplus, uh, you're, you're letting yourself eat those carbs, your protein intake is high. Um, and I look, I, I think that training for strength usually is a much better pursuit, especially for women, because women tend to more often than men tend to fall into the trap of trying to be lean all the time and, and tend to be a little afraid of the scale changing or whatever. And focusing on strength tends to be very healthy. And, and, and there's a lot of strength that women tend to um, kind of have untapped without realizing. And then when they switch that mentality and train for strength, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel amazing. I have all this energy. My libido's up. My metabolism's up. I'm building great curves. I've got my butt is building. Everything's kind of coming together. So I think this is a great transition. It's a much healthier one than the one you, you came from where you were putting your, you know, presenting yourself on stage. Did you compete in, in bikini, bodybuilding, physique? Which one um, did you do? I did a bikini. Okay. Uh, I started since 2018, but uh, I'm ready to let that go. I noticed since I'm getting older, I'm 35. So I feel like I feel a little weaker and I don't like that feeling. So I kind of want to close that chapter and just move on to something different, especially since us women are, are prone to osteoporosis and being in a, in a strict diet plan, reducing calories up to like even a thousand two, a thousand four. I know it's not good for me. So I'm ready to transition out of that and just live heavy, you know, be smart, eat smart. And uh, right now I'm, I'm, I'm eating when I'm hungry. So I'm eating protein. I'm eating my veggies, but I'm having carbs in every meal because I want to be able to lift and grow that strength as well. Yeah. You're going to love it. I, you know, I'd love for you to actually just circle back with us after you go through this. Cause I think you're a perfect person to hear from that's been bodybuilding training and dieting that way for so long <clears throat> experiences performance and then goes into power lift. I think it's going to be a really cool story to hear after you've gone through that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, Amanda, that um, I've experienced with clients like you is that there's this untapped strength that wants to surface, but what's prevented it from really coming out is the restrictive dieting, the high volume training, the the tons of cardio, especially when you're getting ready for a show. So it's like it's it's like this like under the surface is all the strength that wants to just come out, and then when you really train yourself properly and feed yourself, because you've got the training background, because you've been training for so long it explodes out of your body and you just, it's going to blow your mind. You're really going to love uh, the way it feels. And in my experience, women that train, when they make this transition, they almost never want to go back. And if they do, they go back and get on stage and it's very different. They've got more muscle, faster metabolism. Uh, they feel much healthier. So this would be a great experience. You said you're a trainer. Do you have uh, maps prime and prime pro? Yes, actually, um, we've, we've helped a lot of clients with that. And uh, especially on myself, uh, I have a lot of, uh, what we notice on clients and myself is just like, I, I get a stress right here in my upper body, my shoulders yeah. and lower back pain. So we do everything with the uh, Prime Pro and and uh, what was the other one that you have? Uh, Prime. Prime. Yes, we use both. And that helps uh, that helps us a lot. And the clients, uh, Marisol is the one who came, I think, a couple of weeks ago with you guys, too. So, um, you know, everything works with that. And thank you for that. Yeah, good deal. Oh, All right. Nice. So we're going to send you performance. Uh, but then after that, power lift will be, I think. Ideal. So, and I see that you got your Christmas tree. I was up just here. gonna say, yes. dude. You're, you're I actually, people. I actually put it up on Halloween, but I love. <laughs> wow. Halloween. You're one of those. Uh, I'm an, I'm you're an one early, of those people. I'm an early this, person too. Not that early. Uh, like we'll, we'll go up this week. So that's funny. That's <laughs> Mariah yeah, Carey. No shame because in two weeks is going to be Thanksgiving, and by the time you know it, Christmas is around the corner. Right. So, I like to enjoy it. But uh, real quick, back to the question. Um, so you recommend. Right now, um, finishing symmetry and then going to performance. Yes. And then after performance, what do you guys recommend after that? Like power lift. Power lift. Power lift. Okay. Yep. That's yep. when you're gonna that's where you're, that's where you're gonna first yeah. of all, you're gonna see Start strength gains with in. you're gonna see strength gains with power with performance. <laughs> For awesome. sure. Uh, but then when you get to power lift, and, then and by the way, good. that would be the like the, the most perfect cycle I would write. Like let's say you go on this kick of like getting into powerlifting meets and you want to power lift for the next year or two. Running okay. you through perf performance, or excuse me, symmetry, performance, and then powerlift. Oh, that's wonderful. Symmetry, performance, powerlift. Symmetry, performance, powerlift would be a great okay. cycle to kind of run you through to get you ready every time for a meet. Just it, it would all, it'll dress everything I would be concerned about as a coach if we we're just mainly focused on powerlifting to make sure that you stay, keep those joints nice and healthy that's and it. mobile. Sounds good, guys. All Thank right. you awesome. so much. I knew, I knew I was stuck. I didn't know who to call and I, I was like, let me message and email Mind Pump, and you guys are awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank All you, right, Amanda. Thanks for calling in.
You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. It's got to be one of my favorite uh, people to train is is uh, women who go from the like the dieting. I have to look a particular way mentality. I've been doing this for a long time. Then you get them to switch to training for strength. Yeah, and it blows mind their mind every <clears throat> single time. Well, so they're my also favorite things to watch. Yeah, they're one of my favorite clients to train too. Also because she's already proven she has incredible discipline. Yeah, yeah, that's right. what I mean. Yeah, if you, you know, if you've the, competed on stage, you've already you've already been able to be disciplined with the diet, be disciplined disciplined with the training. So if I can just get you to change the focus a little bit now, mm -hmm. like in, in the mobility direction or the powerlifting totally. direction, uh, they see incredible. That's why I wanted to hear back from her. I'd love to hear her experience over the next three to six months. I bet it, it blows her mind. Our next caller is Dre from Michigan. Dre, what's happening, man? How can we help you? What's going on, guys? What up? What's up? What's up, man? What up, though? <laughs> <laughs> All righty, guys, man. Hey, um, I guess um, one of them, man, thanks for everything that you guys do, man. I've been listening to the podcast for shit, man, um, about three, four months now. My girlfriend actually put me on to you guys because she's into fitness as well, so kind of a fitness couple here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I've been died, um Ah, I'm a little nervous now. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's a keeper, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. She's actually in there working out right now. So, um, yeah, man, I guess um, I guess really my question is, so, so for the last four months, and I've been diving and listening to all of you guys' podcasts, um, and since then, I've personally gotten more you know, uh, dedicated or more uh, serious with the fitness goal. Um, during, I guess, give me a little bit of background for me, um, during the whole COVID-19 pandemic, all that crap, I actually took that time and decided to actually go crazy in the gym. So I'm not sure if you saw those pictures I sent you. The left one is when I first started right before or right during the COVID and the right is a, a year um, apart. Um, I've been training and I guess my first goal was to gain uh, mobility and actually lose a little bit of the weight there. Uh, now that I've done both those things here, my mobility has definitely increased. I can, uh, with my squats, um, I can uh, ask the grass, you know, with great form and posture. Um, now I want to train more so in the, um, like an athlete, if you will, or like a, uh, with the explosive power, but I'm nervous because I'm always wanting to work out by myself. Uh, I want to, train like that, but I don't want to hurt myself. You know what I mean? So I guess uh, any tips or tricks you guys have for me or. Yeah. Dre, you know, are you, are you, did you, when you went through this process, did you start or go through any of our programs yet? Or have you not used one of our programs yet? Man, you know, I haven't used one of you guys' programs yet. Um, my girl did get the, um, I think it's maps abs or something like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, you know, you, I had to train, man, and get that fat off before I, did anything with abs, you know, so <laughs> yeah. I didn't touch the abs at all, man. So I, I think the perfect place for you to start is actually our map symmetry, symmetry program, and then to work into performance. Mm -hmm. So the combination of those, the two of those would be really, really good for you. So I'll have Doug send symmetry over to you. And then we have a program that is like specific to exactly what you want to do, which is maps performance, which will lay the foundation. But the the idea that, and I, I don't know how, how old are you, because I'm I'm I I am somebody who is an athlete at heart, and I'm also very scared to go train, even even with my knowledge, to go jump in the gym and start doing explosive movements. How old are you? Yeah, man. So I'm 36. Yeah. Um, be 37 here in March. Um, yeah, man. And yeah, 36. So yeah, I, you want to lay lay a solid foundation first. That's map symmetry for you, and then transition into performance. So that that's literally like the next six months of what training should look like for you and, and, and follow the, follow the program to a T. Yeah. Dre, the key, the really, the key to preventing injury is to scale back. So the exercises should be exercises and movements that you can perform comfortably that you can perform with good technique and good form. And then okay. when you feel like you master those techniques, then you incrementally advance yourself. So you always want to train below your, your threshold Train, mm. master that, and then move up a little bit. So you're always kind of moving yourself up slowly. And if you do it that way, your risk of injury is quite low. When people okay. hurt themselves is when they push themselves to their threshold as if they're in competition 
in the gym. Now, there's nothing you know necessarily wrong with doing that, but the risk of injury goes up quite a bit. When you're testing your capacity, that's when the risk of injury goes up because you're pushing your body to the limit. So if you train below that, whatever that may be, and really master that level to the point where you're like, okay, I can move up a little bit in either tension or in speed or in depth or whatever. If I can progress myself just a bit, but still feel quite you know comfortable, that'll keep you pretty safe. And that'll progress you. That'll progress you at a really good pace. Yeah. Well, you already have the right uh, idea coming back in and like realizing that just jumping back into athletics is probably not going to do you all that great. Like it, there's no real like light way to just jump into whatever you're doing. I don't know if what, what did you play any sports uh, preceding this? Oh, yeah, man. So uh, all throughout grade school, man, I was kind of a two-athlete kind of, kind of guy. So basketball, football, and, mm -hmm. you know, I ran a little – well, my football coach would always make me run a track. So <laughs> yeah. I kind of was forced into that, uh, into that, you know what I mean? But really enjoyed it, man, um, uh, growing up. And I think what scares me about really um, training explosively is because I have this, you know, the, you know, you guys heard it countless times, but that extra gear with the the whole, you know, I can go the extra mile, you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially, you know, when I first started my journey, I was really heavy into, you know, I'll pop on the CT Fletcher you know, audio and just, mm -hmm. you know, go, you know, try to go crazy, you know what I mean? In a sense. So, yes, um, yeah, man. typical athletes stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like that's, that's why I'm always like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy you're coming in with that type of mentality because to, to lay down the groundwork, to, go through and see like where you're at right now. Like uh, currently your body, the, the state and the shape it's in, like your, your joints, the functionality, the strength. So you can address all that in symmetry. Uh, it's going to reveal itself. You can build strength, support and stability there, uh, and then move your way back in and sort of climb that ladder back to peak performance, which, uh, you know, is, is the smart way to do yeah, it. Yeah. And you can even, you can even, you know, once a week go out to the field or the court, don't play against other people. Cause that's going to be too tempting for you to you know, to, to push your intensity, but do, yeah. do drills and stuff on your own, light drills, easy drills on your own, just to get your body familiar to moving, um, you know, like you did before. So you'd go out in 30 minutes, 60 minutes of, of, you know, some of the drills you remember doing when you played, uh, you know, when you were in the track or when you played basketball or football and just and do them at like 60, 70% intensity. And so literally you're going to go out there and feel like, well, I, I could definitely push myself harder. That's okay. That's where you want to start and get your body re-familiar with moving in that particular way. Um, in a perfect world, he would actually combine that when he gets into performance, right? When you get into the mobility mm, days. That's right. So it's if, skills training, if yeah. I was actually coaching and, and training you, I'd have you run through symmetry, literally how we laid it out. That's the program we're going to send to you, right? So I'm gonna, we're going to send you that one for free. Go through symmetry. Then after that, you're going to get into MAPS performance. When you go through performance... Every other day, you do these mobility days, and there, so it's basically like dynamic stretching. In a perfect yeah. world, I would have you either go go down to the a, a local field or go over to the basketball court, whichever one you, you wanted to do. You do those mobility drills, and then you would do exactly what Sal's doing. Do some of your your favorite drills that you do in basketball okay. or football, and kind of ease your way in. The combination of that strength training program with that mobility with like light drills would be the perfect way right. to get you in back into like full speed sport by like, you know, middle, middle of the summer next year. That's right. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you guys got one more time for another question. I just want to throw some of my numbers to you uh, as far as body fat percentage. Um, I'm at a 15.1% body fat muscle mass, 145.5 body water, 62.2% lean body, 154.9 pounds, um, bone mass, 9.4, protein, 17.5, visceral fat, 10, BMR is uh, 18, uh, 88, uh, metabolic age uh, reads 34. Okay. That's good, all good. Yeah, you're in a good place. Yeah, that's all fine. 15% you're, you're body fat's a good athletic body fat. Yeah. You know, you can get a little leaner too. You can even get a little heavier. You're, you're going to be okay right around that 15% is a good body fat percentage for most athletes. You know, some people get down as low as 10, but that depends on the individual, but you're, you're, you're in a good place. You are. And honestly, by when you start getting into this program, because it's yeah. going to be so different from probably how you, you, you train, you'll you're, build muscle. Yeah. You're going to build muscle. You'll naturally lean out. So however you're eating diet wise right now, I'd probably keep it that way. Unless you're really trying to cut right now. I wouldn't want you cutting hard while we're doing performance type stuff. I want you fed. Uh, but you don't, yeah. you, 
Yeah. Are you are you fed? I'm sorry, right I didn't mean to cut you off. I actually wanted to build a little bit, you know, so I was looking to add. You know, okay. More calories. Yeah, you're good. yeah, you're good. Then. You're good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Add calories. That's I would rather I would rather that's the only thing I wouldn't want you in a cut right now. I would say if we're trying to get back into athletic that's shape right. yeah. and I'm going to put you on a program like this, I'd rather Much you be fed. in a slight bulk than actually, you know, in any sort of a cut whatsoever. Yeah, and what'll happen, Dre, is your weight won't change that much, but your body composition probably will. So your weight might change a pound or two on the scale, but you'll drop like a couple percent body fat and gain a few pounds of muscle. By the way, that's how you know you're doing a perfect job at this, is if, if you're able to increase calories, say 300 to 500 calories a day, and you not gain weight and you're following the program, then we have a pretty, I mean, that means we're probably putting on muscle and leaning out at the same time. And if you feel good and feel fed at that, that, that means you've hit it perfect. Yep. Awesome, man. Appreciate right. it. Cool. Well, thanks for calling in, Dre. Awesome, man. Thanks, thanks. Appreciate All right, man. Good luck. Good one. No problem. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you know what the challenge, <clears throat> the biggest challenge with that <clears throat> is always ego because- yeah, Ex-athlete. Yeah, well, I mean- <clears throat> Even look, I, I you know I've I've, only, I've done non-conventional sports, but even in the gym, you'll work out or I'll work out, and I'll be like, okay, I, I know I got to keep my intensity at this level. I haven't done this particular exercise or pushed myself this way. But then you feel good. Mm-hmm. You do it. And you're like, ooh, I feel good. Yeah. And that that inner you know challenge comes out. And you're like, let me push it a little further. So that's the big challenge is ego, because he could go out and do drills and be like, oh my god, I feel like my old self. <laughs> Let yeah. me go play a pickup you game. Just jump in a game. Yeah, easy. yeah, that's right. I and mean, I, I love happens. the fact that he's only been listening for a few months and he's already has the right mindset. Totally. Right? I mean, because I, I think one of the hardest things to convince athletes is to even go through that process or even to become aware that, hey, I probably- There's sh- another way you should do this. Yeah, yeah, I have a feeling I shouldn't just go in right back into my sport. So the fact that he's already smart enough and aware of that, uh, you know, I, I just hope he follows the program to it. If he does- I think he's going to feel amazing by summertime next year. Yeah, you really, your body, remember, if when you don't do a movement for a long time, your last memory of how you did it was with a different body. So <laughs> you try to apply that to the new body, yeah. that's when problems happen. I learned that lesson a few times. Our next caller is Rebecca from New York. Hi, Rebecca. How can we help you? Hi, guys. So I've um, been listening to your podcast. I'm a recent listener, and I appreciate everything you're doing. And... Uh, My question is this, with some context. I am a former professional Latin dancer. I am now a PT, and I'm trying to serve the Latin dance community. Um, In one of your recent podcasts, one of you guys said, if you're training for your uh, sport, right, maybe you have to sacrifice a little bit of your aesthetic. Um, If you're training for your aesthetic, maybe you sacrifice a little bit of your performance. So my question is, as a dancer, that's like not really possible. The aesthetic and the performance kind of have to marry each other. So I'm wondering if there's a way you guys recommend training so that these dancers are not only strong, but also have the aesthetic that they want to achieve. Yeah, well, okay. so I'm so glad you brought that episode up because there's a little bit of confusion around that. When we talk about sacrificing performance for aesthetics or vice versa. We're talking about the extremes. That's right. Um, And what you're talking about is a sport that requires both. You want to have performance. You also want to look good. And with dancing, there is an element of improved performance when you're also leaner, when you also have some of the aesthetics, right? Because you could train as a dancer and just get maximally strong, but get a little bit too thick and heavy which will also uh, impede on your performance in dancing as well. So in your particular case, I would focus on the performance and then I would eat healthy and the aesthetics will follow with that. When we talk about what we talked about, we're talking about people who are so extreme in their pursuit. Like if you want to be like a the strongest power lifter, you're not going to be shredded, right? Or if you want to be on stage as a bodybuilder at 2% body fat, well, you're not going to be the strongest you're going to be and you're not going to have the health uh, that you want. So but in your particular case, when it comes to a sport like dancing, where the visual and the performance are both important, it's 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 not a bad balance. It's actually not a bad balance at all. So I would focus just on the performance, eat healthy, and you'll and you experience this as a competitor yourself. Like if your diet was good and you were just practicing your your movements and dancing quite a bit, you looked apart, right? It wasn't like you had to sit there and really focus on you know, getting shredded or anything like that. Like let's say a, a, a physique competitor, what, what it was really about keeping the balance between the two. So that's kind of, that's kind of the idea. How much, okay. how, how much dancing are we, are we talking about? Like as far as practice, how often? So I don't, I don't do this anymore, but I serve clients who do, I mean, they're nonstop 
they're dancing or performing or teaching every weekend, rehearsing every night. So it's pretty intense in terms of how much they're doing. Um, and I'm trying to come in with the education on rest, hydration, nutrition, all that stuff on top of getting away from the passive stretching and moving more towards uh, strength training. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing to consider is at a very high level of competition in dancing, you are going to sacrifice a little bit of health in the, in the sense of maybe joint health. Like I'm sure at the highest level of competition, most dancers probably have issues with their feet or their ankles knees. or their knees yeah. or, you know, so at that level, there is a bit of a trade-off because you're trying to push yourself to be the best in the world. Now, if you're working with somebody that's kind of doing this as a hobby um, and, and, you know, they, they like doing it, it's fun, they do it on the weekend, uh, then I wouldn't sacrifice one or the other. But are you talking about high, super high level competitors? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about people who travel, perform internationally. They okay. are, this is their job. They're high level performers, athletes. So I've, I've, I've trained a handful of clients like this. And you know what I found as a coach was one of the most challenging things was actually getting them out of like poor eating habits. So because because they they do have to have like a, a lean physique, they 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 restrict a lot of food and then they they train you know dance a ton, and so they they keep their weight in check, but then they don't have like the the tightest most aesthetic physique they could have because the way they diet they eat they don't eat enough protein intake they they go from maybe off season not eating the best and then they go all of a sudden they cut and they're eating celery sticks all day long and they're eating low low calorie just to keep the body fat down. So a lot of my conversation was uh, educating them on the importance of a, a high protein diet. They really didn't need that much strength training. I was only strength training them like one time a week, full because of all the dance they were doing because they're right? dancing so much. But really trying to teach them how to feed the body properly and that they they could and they can eat. So that was my experience at least. I mean, they tend to have that. I can't weigh. I can't be this much. And so when they're in season dancing, they would like restrict the calories. But then I look at the diet. And it's like a salad and celery and all these like low calorie, low nutrient foods. And then they're doing all this crazy and then and they're pushing their bodies at extreme levels of dancing. And so yeah. teaching them how to feed their body properly, how to strength train one time a week so that we, we can have some muscle mass on us and have a good metabolism. But then again, still focusing on their sport because their sport is dancing. To me, that's kind of the, 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 the balance or the, the dance that you have to do as a coach is, you know, how do I keep them fed properly and then teach them and educate them the importance of strength training like one time a week so they can perform at optimal levels for their, for their dance. Yeah. So. You know, the other thing too, is you're, you're training in a very uh, rare demographic. These are high level. I mean, you're, so you're training high level competitors. Your job yes. as a trainer or a coach is number one to prevent injury. It's, it's not to improve their performance. You want to just manage and make sure that they they don't hurt themselves. So a lot of their exercise is going to be kind of correctional exercise. That's going to be the majority of it. And if you do any strength training, it's going to be very minimal and basic because of the amount of volume that they're already doing with the amount of training that they're doing. Like if you throw too much strength training on top of what they're doing, then you really mm -hmm. run the risk of increasing uh, the risk of injury. Did you did you listen to the episode that we did with Corey Schlesinger, mm -hmm. the NBA yeah, strength and conditioning coach? That. No, you should listen. Yet. You should listen to that. That episode. would be very valuable. Yeah. It's a really good episode, and I and the the way I want you to listen to it is to think as his NBA athletes, like your dance athletes, like in season, and he does he does a lot of what's called microdose training with his athletes okay. in season mm -hmm. because obviously basketball is that the highest priority in their sport while they're in season. So like your dancers while they're in season, that's of the highest priority, and so the way he strength trains them is in these micro sessions, very very short couple exercises. That's you know what would be good for this is maps fifteen. Maps 15. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Maps yeah. maps fifteen would be perfect. Spreading the load out and the stimulus, so that way they're still getting those kind of strength exercises, but it's not too much in terms of uh, volume intensity because they already have all that excess of movement and activity that they're working on performance wise. So that would just help to to aid into you know strengthening, supporting their joints. Yeah, it's literally fifteen minutes a day of strength training, and I think that would, okay. that would probably you know just based off of. The feedback that we get from top level um, strength coaches, uh, you know, who are training athletes in season, this is, they say, the best approach. And I agree with them. I think 
that's during the season. What about when there's that off season or can they do a little bit more yeah. training like yeah. days a week? That's right. That's right. I just, and, and, Especially and, if you can bring down a bit of the dancing. There just you go. A bit. Yeah, yeah. Like take some of that volume down. You could focus a little <laughs> more on strength yeah. training. I know yeah. it sounds impossible, but that, that would be ideal. But I mean, that's, you, that's the, again, that's the dance that you have to do as a coach is if they're, if they're doing hours of dancing every single day, I can't be yeah, a lot of cardio and then some trick. So here's the thing. They have competing. to be strong enough as, as the guy and the girl to do tricks as well. Cause they're lifting each other. They're facing, they're supporting, they have to fly. So they're like, I want to be stronger, but then also there's so much cardio in this world of Latin dancing too. Yeah. Well, you know, here's, okay. So, I mean, a lot of the strength um, based movements that are done in sports are highly technical. Like for example, like I could lift 200 pounds over my head. Okay. But if you give me a 105 pound dancer and tell me to lift her the way that a dancer is supposed to, I'm probably going to fail because there's so much technique that's involved. So then practicing these lifts and their dancing is really going to maintain that. As far as adding more strength uh, in season, it's going to be these microdose workouts. You're not going to do an hour of strength training with them. Now, off season, I would reduce the dancing a little bit. And then I'd introduce more traditional strength training, deadlifts, overhead presses, bench presses, rows, and that kind of stuff. But if they're in season, I really think MAPS 15 is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to be your best approach for sure. We'll send that to you, by yep. the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then after that, when you're off season, MAPS anabolic is good. MAPS strong is mm -hmm. good. MAPS symmetry is good. Those are all good programs performance, yeah. that I think, or MAPS performance. Those are all great programs for, for off season. Rebecca, are you in our, our private forum? No. I'm going to have Doug give you access to our private forum too. That way you can get, because here's the thing too, like when you're talking about the type of athlete you're talking about, like every case is very individual too. So like it, it might help to be able to have access to us and be like, Hey, I have a client. This is the, this is the condition. This is the issue. This is the challenge. And then we can be more specific than I, I know right now we're talking very general. And yeah, I, I think, uh, I would, I would give you different advice based on each case, right. On what, you, what their challenges because there are so many moving parts and so many different uh, exceptions to the rule on what I might advise someone based off of what what's happening with that current you know client of yours or that athlete so we'll give you access to that and then uh, send you maps 15 also awesome thank you yeah. all right thanks for calling in no problem thanks bye thank you good good uh, good addition Adam because mm -hmm. uh the more advanced the athlete is the more specialized <laughs> The advice and the training. Why did you be, lie uh, to her though about your the dance moves and lifting over your head? I've I literally walked in yesterday and you were doing the dirty dancing thing with Justin. Yeah, it was really. I mean, that part where he jumps and runs and yes, yeah, lift yeah. him above my head. Yeah, that was. <laughs> we're getting better. We are. We're getting good. Yeah, it, we One finish. Of these days, we we'll finish it with a kiss. Live. <laughs> I, I, low, I, I slowly lower him and. Uh. I don't like that part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, hey, it's the only way favorite. I'll practice with you. Yeah. We got to do the whole thing. Fine. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I mean, that, that's another point too. Is I mean, she's a physical therapist. She said so. I'm sure she knows some of that, but oh, there's so much know. skill. She had a physical therapy background and even that's what she said. Oh, I didn't catch that. There's or maybe I read it. I read in her question. Um, that, you know, that so much of strength moves in sports is technique. It's yeah. not necessarily like, oh, I can lift this much weight. Therefore I can do this. Yeah. I mean, movement. I, not, not, not really, not necessarily. Well, also too, I mean, she's got to have an off season. I know like that's, that's another one of the things because they're constantly traveling and yeah. it's like a year round. It's tough. It's tough to really focus, hyper-focus on strength training when you don't like, uh, present it with adequate time to really focus on it. I, you know, when you get to athletic, any sport at this, le this high level, this is like training a, a professional football player or basketball player, the micro tweaks uh, for them are so, so individual. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's really hard to give like this, this, I, I mean, yeah, what, if this was a bunch of 15 year old kids that were just trying to build general strength, right? Yeah. Real easy advice. Right. So, it, so I want to go back to what you addressed in that that ep I mean what we say what we said in that episode is still very true like the, this as far as the if you are a super hyper focused athlete and you're dancing 2 hours a day every single day you're going to sacrifice a little bit on body sculpting you are yeah. not going to have a women's bikini competitor physique now does that not mean that there's not anomalies that look like a bikini sure. competitor and is not a great dancer cuz she has great genetics no of course there's those anomalies but if you're trying to train to look like a bikini competitor and also a dancer, something's got to give. Yep. Um, and so those, those those same rules apply. And then to Justin's point, 
when you're an athlete like that, uh, you you do need to have somewhat of an off season. You know, you you can't be doing dance. Also, this is a unique sport because you know what it reminds me of. It reminds me of old the old school bodybuilding competitions. The very first bodybuilding competitions, you would come out and you would do a feat of strength and then you would flex and pose. And if bodybuilding was like that today, there's no way these these athletes would hit the stage at two percent body fat. They yeah. wouldn't be able to because they wouldn't be able to do the feat of strength. So there's a balance when it comes to these dance sports. You got to have the aesthetics mm -hmm. and the performance. So you got to kind of balance the two out. Unlike, you know, uh, like you said, football, like there's no balance. Who cares what you look yeah. like? Go play and let's see if we can make you play better. Well, and I, I think too, really the nutrition is the biggest yes. thing that you can right. like have control over in this situation and, and, and present your body, um, you know, a little more aesthetically, like you can manipulate. So I think that if you put a little more emphasis in that during the season, I think that'll go so that, far. That, this has my, been my experience. Okay. I've only trained a handful. But in my experience, they when they get into season and they have their outfits and they got to be performing on stage and they 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 all want to look a certain way and so they go into this like extreme diet yeah and they just it's just all about calories they cut their calories like crazy and they're already doing so much activity so they they definitely reduce weight right they drop down but they do it in such an unhealthy manner that they don't have the best looking physique they potentially right. could have they don't have the the healthiest the strongest because they're not feeding their so most exactly. of my most of my mm -hmm. effort with these clients was around like teaching them how to feed their body properly and how to balance out their macros that to me was the the, the biggest game changer in their yeah. supporting them in what it helps you to. avoid inflammation all these other things joint pain like if you're you know if you're just uh, not eating uh you know ideal foods and like processed foods and things are making their way in it, it really affects the performance oh well, you, know? you, you there's a high rate of things like osteopenia in uh like dancers like ballet dancers i mean these, these are people who are training their bodies hard yet how are they getting bone loss let's see they don't eat yep they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're they're not eating enough nutrients so yeah. that's i mean you hit the nail on the head with that our next caller is josie from indiana hi josie how can we help you hi so I, um, I'm an artist and a florist and I've been lifting weights since eighth grade with decent progress beginning in 11th grade. I've been listening to your show for about two years. Um, and I've gone through the whole back cat catalog. I've really enjoyed it. And with using your info and your advice, when my brother started lifting, I was able to teach them like how to go to the gym and how to, how to lift weights. And now they're a lot stronger than me, which is a bummer, but <laughs> I guess it means I did my job. All right. Yeah, um, job. I'm now a freshman in college and I'm struggling with my fitness goals. I love weightlifting and I really enjoy seeing my physique change from lifting weights and getting stronger. And I also really enjoy walking and running. I run like at like two to 10 miles a week. It really depends how I'm feeling. And then I walk probably about 28,000 steps a day right now with some, I'm kind of expecting that to change since winter is coming and in Indiana, the winter is rough. Uh, I can get above 40,000 steps without really trying that hard. Uh, I lift weights five to six days a week, averaging about 90 minutes per session. And my, my problem is this, I lost weight that I couldn't afford to lose this summer I'm five, five, 104 pounds, and I lost about 15 pounds. So for me, the 120s is way healthier. And I'm currently averaging out to about 2,000 calories a day. To, like I eat more or less uh, depending on the day. And I'd like to bulk up sooner rather than later. And I know your programs are great. And I've heard a lot of your information, but the problem is knowing what direction to go because I know an incremental approach would be like generally the best direction. Um, but my weight right now is just not sustainable. So I need to like get it up faster. And uh, I can't do like the don't look at the scale approach because my weight is just like not right for my height and not right for my body. So I would love to know how to like gain weight in the healthiest way possible and just how to like boost my metabolism and make it work with the amount of steps that I take every day yeah, because I'm not a person who would like to be a 10,000 step 
maximum. Okay, I gotta. I, I have to know more about that. Okay, I, the only time I've ever seen steps consistently that high was when I trained a professional soccer ref. So what are <laughs> what are you doing to get twenty eight to forty thousand steps a day? That is insane. I I'm a commuter on a college campus, and so I have some time before and after classes, and I love walking and listening to podcasts and that's i live in a really walkable town so i just i just get out there a lot and then i fall asleep if i try and read sitting down so i just tend to read my college stuff like walking on the treadmill and it it just kind of accumulates but like i said during the winter i don't think i'll be hitting it like really getting it that easy so well, the, the it should cra- go down. Okay, so and the and the goal is for us to get our weight up a little bit and build some muscle. I, I actually think it's going to naturally happen. If I mean that is so many steps that you reducing that by fifty percent, it's going to change your 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 calorie deficit so dramatically that you'll probably start to see a little bit of waking. And if not, we increase our calories a tiny bit and we focus on strength with like a MAPS anabolic type yeah. of a program. Josie, are you noticing any, any? do you have any signs of hormonal imbalances? Is your, your menstrual cycle off? Or are you noticing any changes in hair and skin, cold, hot, tolerance, uh, energy, libido, anything like that? Yeah, so that that is why I know I need to gain weight like right now is because my menstrual cycle has been off for a couple years. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. And it just, like my skin is always on and off. Right. So I know that that is off. Okay, look, so I'm going to give, I, this is an easy answer. So that what I'm going to give you is actually very simple. The challenge is going to be following through because you love exercise. You have a bit of a, and you know, I'm going to say this very lightly, but a bit of an unhealthy uh, relationship with exercise. And I'm I'm speaking from experience. This is the challenge that I have as well. So the answer is very simple. And if you do what I tell you, you're going to get what you want. The challenge is going to be doing it. Okay. So what I'm going to, what I, what I would do if, if you were my client and if I could get you to do what I want you to do, I would tell you to take the next week off completely. So you do no exercise, no running. You can keep walking, but I would do no exercise whatsoever. Continue to eat the way you are. And then when you get back the following week, I would have you lift tw- twice a week. That's it. Two days a week of lifting. I would do no running, especially with the amount of steps that you're taking. And you will see if you follow that, first off, when you get back to lifting the following week, you'll be stronger than you were immediately because your body needs that rest and that recovery. Um, And then following that, you will see the strength gains and you will see improvements and your menstrual cycle will come back within a few weeks, probably maybe at most within six weeks if you follow that. But the challenge is going to be, can you do it? Can you do just two days a week? Okay. Um, so I have so I have a question on the nutritional side of that because I I understand what you're saying and I will I will try to I'll write it down and try and follow that next week. Um, what I've been having trouble with recently is like is trying to get my calories up and then it's it's kind of led me into this like binging cycle at night because I'm like well anything works yeah. so then I end up eating a cup of peanut butter and <laughs> I am just like what it the the information is so conflicting yeah on like do carbs do fats eat whatever you want over, yeah, make it strict you're overthinking so it. just so, like in this scenario can you i'm ha- overthinking it but like if i if i eat what i want i'll eat a cup of peanut butter every night that, so it's like i need a little bit that's because you're so depleted <laughs> and your body's mm-hmm. starving for that your body's fat. starving yeah, starving for that fat you're that's severely o- overtrained and underfed right now is, yeah. is where you're at you just so, need to bulk the cal build the calories up throughout the day can you literally. have can you have dairy or are you is dairy okay for you yeah so you can have a glass of milk that that wouldn't bother your, your tummy yeah, what does your breakfast look like too well i'm gonna give you this because yeah. this is gonna be easy if you could have milk if milk doesn't bother you just do this. Mm-hmm. Eat like you're doing and have a eight to 10 ounce glass whole of milk. whole milk yeah. with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That will add the right amount of calories, fats, proteins, a little bit of sugar that you're buying. And it's, got, it's nutrient dense. So whole milk, eight to 10 ounces with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's it. That'll do it for you right there. And then two days a week of strength training. We're going to send you MAPS Anabolic. Follow the two day a week option. Okay, thank you. And take next week off. So I would add the milk now. And then I would mm-hmm. take next week off completely. No cart, no running, no lifting. Uh, and here's what you'll notice. Your sleep's going to get better. You're going to get better energy. You're going to start to feel like, man, I'm on fire. Then you're going to come back and work out the following week. And you're going to be stronger. And you're going to be tempted 
to ramp things back up. Don't do that. Stick to two days a week for a while until you get your menstrual cycle back, which is a great sign. When, the, when your period comes back, that's like a very good sign that your body feels healthy enough to be fertile. And I would stay with that for a while. And the challenge is going to be when you start to feel great and you start to get that energy, the challenge is going to be keeping yourself out of the gym and keeping yourself from doing way more stuff. But you got to follow the process. I know you said try. So I'm going to give you a quote from one of Justin's favorite movies. <laughs> there is no try. There is only do. <laughs> so don't try. Just do it. Just sure. blindly do it. Because here's no, what's going to happen. Try. Here's the challenge, Josie. You're in, in, in this, this state of relationship with exercise <laughs> where if you listen to yourself, you're not going to do what I say. So what you're going to have to do, and you've been listening to us for two years, is you're going to have to just be like, like literally, I trust what they say. I'm going to blindly follow because it's going to go against every feeling in your body. Everything in your body is going to tell you to do more. So just blindly, literally just blindly follow what we say, and then you'll get where you want. And then once you start to get there, it'll get a little easier because you'll start to feel a lot better, but you got to blindly follow it for, for a little while. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's right. do that. We'll you send got you this. We'll yeah. send you Maps Anabolic, and then follow to fo up. Follow up with us, Joseph. And then to follow follow Maps Anabolic with Mass Performance and Maps Symmetry. If you want more programming after that, but Maps Anabolic two days a week, perfect. Do that not next week, but the following week. Okay. All right. All, All right. right. All right. Sounds Thanks. good. Thanks, Josie. Thank you. You got it. All right. You know th this is like, uh, bro. I one person in my entire career. Yeah. That you know, yeah, that's a do you understand how many twenty eight thousand of forty thousand steps that's every lot, day bro. is? He was a professional soccer ref. Yeah, doing <laughs> yeah, multiple. You're, doing, you're running up and down yeah. all day long. Not for multiple games. Yeah, yeah. That, or a mail carrier. Mail carriers. Yeah, I, like you that. know, I can't remember training too many mail carriers, but you're I right. did. They were like twenty five to thirty five. thousand. Yes, dude. Like, yeah. I'm talking. About, when she said four, she could easily hit forty. Yeah, I've never yeah. trained anybody. That, that you are not at that level. You are not sitting still She's, all day long. She yeah. exercise and movement is a drug for her hundred percent she's and the, there's and something she's avoiding or it's 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 it, you're running from something it's a very hard it's a very hard thing to break which is why you literally have to go into it and blindly trust and just follow it and just fight every feeling in your body and then you'll, it'll get a lot easier but she's she's in that state like i could i know i've i've, I've been you know well even not the, that bad but i've even, been there and even I know the that craving that she has for peanut butter almost always when i have somebody who's really depleted yeah. like this a female client of mine mm -hmm. that's just not getting enough healthy fats in their diet that that yeah. your, your body is telling you that no wonder you love a cup of peanut butter mm -hmm. it's it's all the fat in there yep. the body is telling Needs you like calories. i want it i need it and, and then you just let go and it's like boom yeah and simply just re i mean reducing the amount of activity increasing a little bit of calories but you're right the hardest it's easy advice hard to take yeah so here's totally. why i gave her the advice of milk because so i've trained people like her exactly like females in this position they've got this kind of unhealthy relationship with exercise and nutrition and so long as they can tolerate milk i like it because it's liquid mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel to them like they're overeating because yeah, you're right. drinking it you don't feel just part of the meal but yeah, three they already do three eight ounce or 10 ounce cups of whole milk. That's like 400 calories, mm -hmm. a lot of protein. Yeah. There's a, some carbs in there, good, healthy fats, nutrient dense, you know, usually it's fortified with vitamin D. Um, she gets the calcium it, that will be, that's like the perfect addition. And then she drops her, her, her training and gets rid of the running. She can keep walking. She'll, her body will respond. It's like, it's like waiting. It's her body's like, please do this yeah. for me. Please let me recover. Yeah. And, and yeah. then watch what happens. Yeah. So, but the hard part's going to be doing it because Whatever she's running from, or the, or how, the re, the reason why she's using exercise the way she is, and maybe she doesn't realize this, but once she stops, it's going to surface. She's going to have to deal with some of those feelings and some of those challenging uh, challenges in other ways. Yeah, so, you're yeah. you're keeping your body that busy. You you are trying to stay distracted from something. I don't yep. know what it is. Only she knows that. Only she's the one that's going right. to be able to work on that. And you're right. Like this is this the beginning. Okay, we can solve it temporarily yep. by getting the calories up, but then eventually whatever it is that. I'm running from or staying busy so I don't have to yeah. think about uh, will surface. Josie, if you're listening to this, do what we say and then yeah. follow. If you need help, follow. In fact, Doug, put her in the forum too. We're going to put you in the forum. I want I want you to give us updates because this is going to be a challenge for you, uh, especially week four, five, six, when you start to feel really good. Mm -hmm. This will be a bit of a challenge. So just keep us updated. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all our free giveaways. we got a bunch of guides that can help you with fat loss and muscle building and strength gains. They're all free, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. 
Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.